On behalf of the University of Saskatchewan, welcome to a conversation with David Suzuki. I would like to begin today's event by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 6 land and the homeland of the Métis. Thank you everyone for taking the time out of your busy days to join us. The topic for today is climate change. Every day we experience the consequences of a changing climate, and that means every one of us has a responsibility to do something about it. At the Paris Conference of the parties meeting last December, in December 2015, a new approach was taken to trying to limit ourselves to a 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in temperature. This suggests that every country has a responsibility to take action to help meet this global goal. It raises very important questions about how we can maximize energy benefits, because everybody needs energy, while also minimizing the environmental impacts, because there's no free lunch when it comes to any energy source. It's a very complicated topic. In Canada, this means the provinces and territories all need to get to work. BC has taken action, Alberta and Ontario have recently taken action, and in Saskatchewan, we've recently set limits to uh, achieve a goal of 50% renewable energy by 2030. And on many levels, we have reason for optimism as well as pessimism when it comes to uh, our changing climate. On the optimistic side, the 1.5 degree target has sent a very strong signal to the renewable energy markets. We have hit a tipping point where new investments in renewable energy now exceed new investments in fossil fuel energy production. Globally, about a quarter of the electricity that we produce comes from, comes from renewables now. In 2015, it was a record year with $329 billion of investment in renewable energy. The International Monetary Fund also in 2015 acknowledged that the $5.3 trillion global fossil fuel subsidy was unsustainable. Now this is a pretty conservative financial institution to make that kind of a recommendation and recognition. So we're seeing significant changes in terms of market forces that are now seemingly pulling for the renewable sector. However, on the more pessimistic side, the INDCs, or the Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, identified at the Paris meetings, may not necessarily get us all the way where we need to be, to that 1.5 degree ceiling. Current accounting suggests that the commitments only get us to 2.7 degrees Celsius. We may be seeing a re renaissance in coal, as Japan recently announced the, the desire to construct 39 coal-fired power plants in the next decade. We're also seeing a rise in nationalism in the United States, in Austria, in Hungary, in the United Kingdom, in Australia. And this may make uh, our ability to collaborate at a global level much more challenging. On the whole, what we need are sustainable solutions. Ones that balance our environmental, social, and economic interests. We need to make a planet that's inheritable for all for generations to come. Fortunately, today we have two speakers who can speak to that topic. Um, we have two passionate advocates with us today. Dr. Ian Morrow, who is a professor and filmmaker at the University of Winnipeg. He specializes in climate change, food security, and resource development. His latest project combines filmmaking, mapping, and uses the Prairie Climate Atlas. His multimedia presentation today will set the stage for discussions about how climate change is affecting Canadian communities, especially those here in the prairies where we live. Dr. David Suzuki needs no introduction for many of you. He is a scientist, a broadcaster, an author, a grandfather, and co-founder of the David Suzuki Foundation. Dr. Suzuki is Professor Emeritus at the University of British Columbia and is the host of CBC's Science and Natural History TV series, The Nature of Things. He will be discussing today humanity's impact as a force of nature that is shaping our planet. 
Will you please join me in giving a very warm welcome to both Dr. Morrow and Dr. Suzuki. Ian? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here. My name is Ian Morrow, and uh, I live in Winnipeg. I'm a prairie person. And I want to talk to you today about the work that I do and the impact that climate change has on our lives. But first, I want to set the stage by telling you how I got here. I studied environmental science in university, and I started to be confronted with the enormous challenges that we have. And as young people, that's very hard to internalize. What does it mean to live in a destabilized environment? You know, moving through an undergraduate degree, you don't feel like you have all the answers, and you certainly don't feel like you have all the tools to figure it out. But you have passion. You have a desire to do something different. And that's what was inside me. We take that in different directions. I decided to channel it into a graduate degree. And I started into a program that led to my doctorate on farmer knowledge and biotechnology in the Canadian prairies. And I was studying the impact of new technologies, genetically modified crops, and you look to who inspires you. And I said, man, there's a guy out there named David Suzuki. And he's using media and these tools to engage people. And I said, if he can do it, why can't I? And so we started to make a film about these issues called Seeds of Change. And in the process of confronting these issues, you want to reach out to those people that inspire you. And I sent David a letter. I said, hey, do you want to be in our movie? And lo and behold, he wrote me back. This is from 2002. He said, this sounds like a great project. I'm super busy. I won't be able to meet you at the place where you're thinking we might be able to convene, but good luck. And so the message is, reach out to those people that inspire you because they might reach back out and touch you. And I'm here today because I built a relationship with David Suzuki. We made this film, and in the process of engaging farmers, talking to them about the issues, they said, you know what? There's lots of challenges. And the challenges in Saskatchewan were pretty significant. The biotechnology had introduced new technologies that were causing problems for organic farmers. Farmers were being sued. You know these issues. You've heard about them. You've lived them. You're from this area. And the farmers in, or, in, in organics in Saskatchewan were trying to reach out and sue the biotech industry and, and get compensation for some of the problems that were occurring. And they reached out to someone that inspired them. They said, David Suzuki, will you help us? And in 2005 in Regina, David came and did a fundraiser for these farmers. And it was an exciting time where there was momentum and there was ideas and there was co and mutual support for these, these initiatives. And a lot of things have changed since then. Perhaps most, me. I'm a little bit wider, I'm a little bit more gray, but somehow this man, David Suzuki, looks exactly the same. <laughs> a fountain of life, whatever you want to call it, he inspires us in all kinds of ways. My wife keeps saying, you got to learn more than just environmentalism from that guy. He's so fit <laughs> at 80 years old. So the film came out, Seeds of Change, it was a major issue, one of the biggest academic freedom battles in the country, according to the Canadian Association of University Teachers. The university had struck a deal with Monsanto to relocate their Canadian corporate headquarters to the University of Manitoba Smart Park, where I was doing my PhD, and the film had some trouble getting out. Once again, David came on the bottom right, researchers, industry, too cozy. He came to the university and spoke out about it, and the film came out. And while this was happening, while I was working in the Canadian prairies, I was also studying and traveling and teaching up in the Canadian Arctic. I was watching climate change over the hottest decade on record, from 2001 to the end of that decade. But that hottest decade on record keeps changing and shifting and moving with us. We're living in a period of dramatic change. In the Arctic, some people say it's at a tipping point, where if the ice melts, and the ocean gets exposed and that dark matter of the ocean starts absorbing all that heat, that ecosystem could flip. And as we know, the Arctic, as many say, are the, is the air conditioner of the world. It has huge global implications. But as I was living in the Canadian Arctic, thinking about climate change, I was seeing the narrative down south. It was polar bears on sea ice. And that was the, the meme, the image 
But for me, that's not what I was seeing. I was seeing people on sea ice, communities reliant on these resources. This is a master carver and hunter named Luki Erud in Iglulik, hunting off the sea ice for walrus. I call this photo a thousand years ago today because if he wasn't holding a jerry can in his hand and he was holding a traditional avatak, a, a seal skin float, this could have been a thousand years ago. But people are living like this today. They're hunting, they're out there. And this is a huge issue for the people of the North. I asked the question, how do kids land safely in this world? I was walking through a glulik and this young man is pedaling his tricycle into that piece of wood, bang! He's flying through the air like Superman. And in a place where there's not a lot of resources for kids, not a lot of programs, this kid is ingenious. He's doing a lot with a little. And that is a key message of our time. We can't continue to live these overconsumptive lifestyles. We have to be creative with what we have. We have to figure out the solutions with the tools we have today. And this image reminds me why youth are so important because they have that creativity. They have that spontaneity. And we have to listen to these children because this is the world they are inheriting. And I'm glad to see a lot of young people here today. As I kept working in the Arctic, I met a guy named Zach Kunuk. For those of you that aren't familiar with him, he made a film called Atanajua at the Fast Runner, which is considered the most important Canadian film ever made. The man running naked on the ice. You should see it if you haven't. And I said to Zach, I'm really interested. I've been working in the Arctic. The elders have said I should be using my knowledge and my skills to help the region. And I'm interested in making a film on climate change. And this famous artist said to me, me too. And we decided to make a film together. And I'm going to show you the trailer for a film that we made called Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change. The film is available online at this website. You can look up Inuit Knowledge and Climate Change. It's a full feature-length film. The woman at the end there, Elisipi Ishulutak, is the oldest woman in Pangertung. I just returned from Pangertung after doing more field research up there. Um, and she's alive and well and thinking about the changes and thinking about the impacts that they have. And for those of you that couldn't see the screen, she said, Inuit are changing. We're all changing. We're all changing. We are all in this together. And as I finish this project, I moved out to Atlantic Canada. I had a Canada Research Chair position out there. And I immediately set out with a team to make this film, Climate Change in Atlantic Canada. Because the Arctic is the canary in the coal mine, according to many people. But it's actually happening everywhere in Canada. Out in Atlantic Canada, the image on the top right there is called uh, Indian Island. It's actually a peninsula. But they started working, this First Nation, with scientists to figure out with sea level rise. So as the oceans get hotter, they actually expand in size. They get bigger. And now we're having more increased storm intensity. And this First Nation realized that at the year 2100, they might not have land left. They likely won't have land left. And so they started to say, well, what do we do about this? And combining traditional knowledge and resiliency of the community with science and technology and engineering, they're building a dike. This is the chief standing on the edge of, of the community. And they're building a 12-foot high dike to protect themselves, while at the same time looking for new land. Imagine you have to start looking for new land. Well, we're all affected by this. Immediately after that, we started making Beyond Climate, a film about BC, looking at oceans, forests, mountains, farmland, different ecosystems, how they're interconnected, and how it links with these human systems, and how communities are on the front edge of actually figuring out some of the challenges. There's some really important work being done at that community scale, and people are actually figuring out how to deal with this issue. And it's inspiring, it's exciting, it's hopeful. There's people that are actually actively adapting. 
you know, mitigation and solving the problem at source is a major issue, but there's people that are addressing this and it's very, very interesting. The city of Vancouver wants to be the greenest city in the world by 2020. They are doing massive things to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions and they're a model for the world. And that's here in Canada. So putting these projects together with climate change in Atlantic Canada, I went to David's office and I said, I got this film. He watched it, took out his day timer. He said, let's tour it around Atlantic Canada. And I had the privilege of touring this film with him across Atlantic Canada. And when we finished that, he said, let's take it across the country. And we were engaging citizens and we continue to engage citizens like today because as we know from the literature, the more local you make these issues, the more visual you make these issues, the more likely people start to realize the impact that it has on their lives and the more likely they are to act, which is the key thing, we need action. And so that's part of the approach to this work. With the BC film, we put together a 30 minute version and we toured it last summer through 12 different communities and engaged people in these kinds of conversations. I then asked David to come out to Winnipeg to give him an honorary doctorate at the University of Winnipeg. And I got the pleasure of interviewing him on stage in an event called A Conversation with David Suzuki. And that's online on YouTube, you can watch it. This man's life, the contribution that he's made, fundraising for these communities that I just showed you, giving his time, like right now, here for free to talk to you about the issues of our time. We, he deserves a lot of credit. But the message isn't he's a great guy, it's that everybody could be like David if we decide. Now moving into the prairies, my home, your home, there's a lot of challenges and I wanna show you a video that sets the context for what I'm about to present on for the rest of my presentation, which will be wrapping up shortly. So at the Prairie Climate Center, which is a new initiative at the University of Winnipeg with the International Institute for Sustainable Development, we're trying to move these regions from risk to resilience. And again, this idea of making it local is really an important part of this. We're mixing climatology with communication tools. And I want to present a couple maps before I finish. Ryan Smith, who's on the camera right here, is a climatologist that works at the Prairie Climate Center. And he's been putting together these data so that I can present them to you. So I want to give Ryan some credit here. If you take a look, that's obviously the Canadian prairies. If you take a look on the bottom left, it's recent, kind of around now, moving into the 2020s. The middle dots are the near future, 2050s, and the far dots are 20. 80s, so kind of far future, getting towards the end of this century. And the, the map that you're looking at right now is the number of hot days, or the number of days above plus 30. If we think about this as prairie people, around now-ish, if you look at the color of the map and the color of the legend, it's about 11 days of plus 30. And as prairie people, we think, yeah, a week, week and a half, maybe two weeks, plus 30, that's uh, kind of fitting into the normal perspective that we have around these things. Jump to the middle of the century, 2050, the map gets red. This is a do-nothing scenario, the high carbon, which is essentially what we're on. 
I'm not showing you the low carbon because you look at what's happening in Saskatchewan right now, you guys aren't going on a low carbon trajectory. The country isn't on a low carbon trajectory. So I'm showing you what business as usual, what we're likely to anticipate. And if you jump to that far future high carbon scenario in the 2080s, a place like Winnipeg, a place like Saskatoon, we're gonna jump from about 11 days on average of plus 30 to upwards of 50 days of plus 30. Imagine two months of plus 30, let's just generalize, two months of plus 30. Farmers can't necessarily grow the crops that flower, canola and wheat, it's gonna change agriculture. Elderly, health and safety, transportation, everything, it's gonna change everything. And this is what the best available science says. Now to wrap your head around that a little bit further, we ask the question, whose climate at present will be like our future climate? Whose climate at present will be like our future climate? Again, the same scale on the bottom. Right now in the 2020s, we're gonna be like in the northern part of the US. Mid-century, we're gonna shift down. It'll be like the states in the center of the US. And by the high carbon, far future scenario, we might have a future climate like New Mexico. And this is for Saskatoon. We have data for all the prairie provinces. That's what summer could be like. And this is a combination of precipitation and heat days, those plus 30 days. And so there's a lot of change on the horizon, but it shouldn't lock you down in a state of paralysis, it should motivate you. We have the ability to do something about this. And so for us, we wanna bring this data to people. And we built this climate atlas, I encourage you to go to this website, you can break down this data by municipality. You can actually look at where you live and see what it will be like. But this is the beginning of the project. And we're launching this project, we got funding from Shirk to interview people in this landscape, to actually say, if this is the future for your region, what does it mean for you? And engage the community in a dialogue because we need to be talking about this. And we need to be talking about it like this. It can't just be social media and all this stuff. We have to have real human engagement. And so this project will engage people in conversation about what the future looks like and how to get ready for it. Because we can do this if we decide to get off our butts and if we decide to elect people that are gonna lead on this issue. So getting into that high resolution future, talking about it, thinking about it, and I encourage you all to take this information into whatever space you think you can get leverage and do something about it. But you're not here to see me, obviously. You're here to see David. David Suzuki is 80 years old. He's a leader in this area. He inspires us, and I'm inspired to be here with him to talk to you about these issues. So thank you very much and it's time for David. Thank you so much Ian. I'm, I'm very, very proud to have been involved in a tiny way with Ian. I see Ian as one of the great uh, eco-warriors of the next generation. I'm delighted to be here. Before I begin, may, may I also acknowledge the Treaty 6 territory of people who cared for these lands for thousands of years. Thank you for coming this morning on this beautiful Saskatchewan day. I always love to come back to this city. I, I love the city, it's a perfect size for me anyway, and uh, I think you're very fortunate to live in this part of the world. Well, we're living in a remarkable moment in all of human history. When what we do or do not do in the next few years could well determine whether we as a species survive by the end of this century. That's a pretty melodramatic statement. You might think, oh, you guys like you exaggerate. What are you talking about? But it's not me that's saying that. Sir Martin Rees, the uh, royal astronomer in Britain, one of the eminent scientists in Britain, was asked on BBC, what are the chances humans will be around by the end of this century? And his answer was 50-50. James Lovelock, the man who coined the idea of Gaia the, to describe all of life on Earth, has written a book in which he says 90% or more of humanity will be gone by 2100. And Clive Hamilton, an eco-philosopher from Australia, has written a book called Requiem for a Species. And guess what species it's a requiem for? It's us. 
And there are others who are actually putting dates on when, uh, when it will, the planet will be uninhabitable by our species. My response is, of course, to feel a shiver of fear going up my spine. But I say thank you for the sense of urgency to all of you. But if you're going to say it's too late, we're going down the tube, then please shut the hell up and go away. Because I think it doesn't do any good to say it's too late. Many of my colleagues are saying this, but for heaven's sakes, just say it at home to your wife, but don't, don't spread this around in, in public, because the reality is we don't know enough to say it's too late. We have to be impelled by hope, but the sense of urgency is palpable today. How did we get to this point in time when we have created problems, especially climate change, that are so severe, we're actually thinking about the extinction of our own species. I'm a geneticist and I've followed with tremendous admiration the way that scientists have been able to use DNA in so many different ways, the genetic material. And one of the ways it's used today is to use DNA imprint to track the movement of humans over time. And all of the trails lead back to Africa 150,000 years ago. That was where we were born. I can't wait for the Ku Klux Klan to invite me to speak. <laughs> so I can tell them, what the hell's your problem? We're all Africans, for God's sakes. That was our birthplace. That's where we belonged. And then, for some reason we don't really understand, we get, began to move away from the plains of Africa where we were born. Probably a population started to grow, perhaps we, uh, uh, we ran out of certain resources. I like to think that it was teenage uh, males that were looking for action, thought they'd uh, find some Neanderthal ladies on the other side of the mountain. You know, we interbred with Neanderthals, but who knows, we don't know why we spread, but we began to move. We began to move into new territories. And when we entered new territories, we were an invasive species. We didn't know how it all worked. Oh my God, there are these slow-moving giant sloths. Hey, they're easy to catch and kill. There are these birds that can't fly. I mean, we found new resources or opportunities. And as human beings, we began to take them because they were so easy and abundant. And after a while, we began to say, oh my God, what the hell's going on? There aren't as many of these birds or, or these mammals around. And so humans had to make a decision. Are we going to stay here? Or are we going to keep looking for new opportunities? So and we began to spread. And the people that stayed realized that they couldn't go on living as their ancestors were who occupied these lands. Because their ancestors who lived in these new lands they, they screwed up, they, they made mistakes. They did things that, that worked. Those were hard won lessons that were passed on from generation to generation. Lessons about how you live on the land and what works and what doesn't. And over thousands of years, those people that stayed in the new places, those were the repository of indigenous knowledge the most profound knowledge from actual life experience of successes and failures that became the heart of the indigenous way of living on the land. And the Brundtland Commission report that came out in 1987 said it is one of the ironies of today that the only group of people around the world who are capable of showing us how to live sustainably are the indigenous people of the lands of the world. 500 years ago, the planet began to change under this wave of exploration and discovery. At least Europeans discovered new lands. The people living there knew damn well who they were and where they belonged. But as the wave of discovery, conquest, and cultural genocide took place, we began to wipe out or try to wipe out that sense of connection and place to the land, to wipe out indigenous knowledge as inferior. And that, I believe, is uh, one of the great tragedies of our time, to lose thousands and thousands of years of accumulated knowledge of how to, about how to live in place. Never be reproduced by science. Science can never reproduce that knowledge. Every time a language, every time a culture disappears, 
This is a great tragedy for humanity. And yet while we grieve over species that are going extinct, we don't look to this repository of knowledge that resides in indigenous cultures all, the wor all over the world as also of great importance. So what has happened is that we have exploded then into the 20th century and we have become the dominant animal on the planet. We're the most numerous mammal on earth. We have a huge ecological footprint just to stay alive. We take takes a lot of air, water, uh, soil and, and uh, uh, clothing and shelter to, to just keep us alive. And we have uh, exploded in terms of our technology, in terms of our consumptive and our global economy. And when you add all that up, we have become a force on the earth as no other species uh, ever, ever has been. I was born, as Ian mentioned, in 1936. When I was a child, I remember my mom and dad wouldn't let me go to movies in the summer because they were afraid I would catch polio. I'm sure most of you have no idea what polio is. When I was a child, they didn't have to worry that I was watching too much television because there was no television anywhere on the planet. When I was a child, there were no cell phones. There were no transoceanic phone calls. There were no computers. There were no uh, uh, satellites. There were no birth control pills. There were, I could just go down a list of all the things that have happened that have become a part of our lives since I was born. Today, you can't even imagine going camping for a week without Wi-Fi. So uh, what a different world we live in. And all of that change, of course, has been accompanied by a huge power to affect the Earth itself. Scientists have now said this period in time, very, we don't know exactly when it started, but the last 200 years have marked what is now called the Anthropocene Epoch, a period in time when we have become the major force affecting the physical, chemical, and the biological properties of the planet on a geological scale. There's never been a species able to affect the planet as we are doing. But in the process, we don't know enough to be able to anticipate problems or to manage our impact on the planet. And so we are undermining the very things that keep us alive, the diversity of living things on the planet, the air, the water, and the soil. So let me explain how I got co-opted into this, in this uh, movement. I had uh, studied in the United States for eight years, getting an education that wasn't possible in Canada at that time, between 1954 and 1962. And uh, I returned. And I thought I'm coming back. This is, a, you have to remember, Sputnik was launched in, on October 4th, 1957. And it had an, a huge impact because we didn't know there was a space, I didn't know there was a space program going on. And every hour and a half that satellite kept turn, circum, circumventing the world and its beep, beep, beep reminded Americans that's a Russian satellite. And the Americans tried to launch their own satellites, and every one of them blew up on the launch pad. And meanwhile, the Russians launched the first animal in space, a dog, Laika, the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin, the first team of cosmonauts, the first spacewalk, the first woman, Valentina Tereshkova. Americans took up the challenge and said, we've got to catch up to these guys. And it was a glorious time. They just threw money at you. Here I am, a foreigner studying in the United States. You just had to say, oh, I love science, and they threw money at you. It was a, a glorious time. There were jobs everywhere. Uh, you didn't even have to apply. They'd come to you asking, would you like to work for us? But I decided in 1962 that I didn't want to live in the United States. I preferred to live in Canada because Canada was different. Not better, but different. And I preferred that difference. Canada to me meant the CCF, which has now become the NDP, which Americans would have called pinko commie. You know, they, they, they wouldn't tolerate a party like the, the CCF. Tommy Douglas was my great hero. Medicare, equalization payments, 
where the richer provinces shared some of their wealth with the poorer provinces. Quebec, the National Film Board, CBC, these were all things that I valued and preferred to live with than in the United States. And so I deliberately left the, United, the opportunities in the US to come back to Canada. And except for the last nine and a half years under Mr. Harper, I have never regretted leaving the United <laughs> States to come home to Canada. We, uh, so I, uh, I, was, I came back, I'd studied for eight years in the United States. Man, I was a hotshot geneticist. I was gonna make my name as a scientist and I got completely sidetracked by a woman. Uh, <laughs> happened over and over in my life, usually a disastrous, but in this case, I'm ever grateful to her. Uh, my greatest regret is that I never met her. She died two years later. But Rachel Carson, in 1962, published a book called Silent Spring, all about the unexpected effects of pesticides. And as a scientist, I was shocked to read this book because as I read the book, I realized, oh, we scientists, we focus. We focus on, a, on growing things in a Florence flask or a growth chamber or even a, a test field but we can't see the big picture. We think we know enough to spray DDT onto open fields, but we're shocked when we find it affects fish and birds and human beings. And we discover things that we didn't know existed. As bird watchers in the late 1950s began to report, hey, birds are disappearing, especially the raptors like eagles. What's going on? And biologists tracked it down and discovered something they didn't know about called biomagnification spray at low concentrations of parts per million, and there the DDT is consumed by microorganisms and concentrated, and at each level up the food chain, you concentrate it. By the time you get to the fatty tissue in the shell glands of birds and in the breasts of women, you've concentrated DDT hundreds of thousands of times. So I began to realize we scientists were all puffed up thinking we're pretty hot. But the reality was our ignorance was vast. And so because of that, I didn't abandon a career in science, but I also became swept up in uh, what we now recognize was the modern environmental movement. Millions of people around the world were caught up in this movement because of Rachel Carson's book. When her book came out in 1962, there wasn't a department of the environment in any government on the planet. The word environment just didn't mean anything at that time. It didn't mean anything that we've come to know it to mean today. But because of her, we, many of us, got involved in issues in, in British Columbia. We celebrated successes. We stopped a proposal to, to drill for uh, oil in Hecate Strait off the coast of BC. The Americans wanted to bring oil super tankers from the north slopes of Alaska through British Columbia waters for, to refine it in Seattle, and we stopped it. There was a proposal to build a dam at Site C on the Peace River, and we stopped that. There was, I got very heavily involved because of a show I did on the Amazon in fighting a dam to be built in Altamira in Brazil, and we stopped it. And we celebrated those great uh, uh, victories. We said, yeah, we won. But 30, 35 years later, guess what? We're fighting the same battles over again. Now, it's not the Americans that want to bring oil super tankers on their coast, it's Canadians. We want to take super tankers along the BC coast. BC government is, despite all of the objections, including the First Nations in the area, the BC government's building the dam at Site C that we stopped 30 years ago. The Brazilian government is building the dam at Altamira that we stopped 30 years ago. The Americans want to drill for oil where we fought against it next to the, or in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and off the coast of British Columbia. So what the heck is going on? I realize that we environmentalists had fundamentally failed. We failed to use the battles as an opportunity to educate people about our place on the planet. We didn't use those battles to change the views, the perspectives of people. And so because of that, we're going to fight the battles over and over again. And so I think we have to understand what the nature 
of the crisis is. Many years ago, the Lytton Indian Band in the interior of British Columbia called me and asked if I would help them prevent logging in their sacred valley, the Stein Valley. The British Columbia government had given Fletcher Challenge, a New Zealand logging company, a permit to log the Stein, and the Lytton people said, that's our valley and it's sacred, we don't want it touched. And so uh, I agreed to join with them in the battle. And at one point, I encountered the CEO of Fletcher Challenge. And when he realized that he was talking to the shit disturber, David Suzuki, we uh, what began as a friendly conversation, escalated into a shouting match. And finally, he said in frustration, listen, Suzuki, are tree huggers like you willing to pay for those trees? Because if you're not willing to pay money, they don't have any value till someone cuts them down. And that for me was an epiphany, because I realized that it was a losing battle. If I had to argue with him in economic terms, he could tell me how many board feet of lumber he had, how many cubic meters of pulp, how many jobs, how much money they were going to make off that, that forest. And I am going around saying, oh, well, gee, we could pick berries every year, and uh, maybe some salal bushes could be used for flower arrangement, and maybe we'll discover a cure for cancer. But the real reason we were fighting for that forest was that valley was sacred. Where in the economy do you put something that's sacred? How do you put a value on something that is sacred? And that forest, as long as it's intact, every green thing is taking carbon out of the air and putting oxygen back in it. Not a bad service for an animal like us. If all the green things in the world weren't, weren't doing that, we wouldn't be here. They keep the planet's atmosphere breathable and healthy for an animal like us. You know what economists say? Well, if we lose the ability to, to photosynthesize, that's an externality. It's not relevant to the economy. So one of the services that nature performs to keep the planet habitable for us is ignored by economists. Those trees are pumping millions of gallons of water out of the earth, transpiring it into the atmosphere and modulating weather and climate. It's an externality. The trees are holding the soil so when it rains, the soil doesn't run into the spawning gravels of the salmon and ruin the, the spawning externality. The forest is a community of countless species of plants and animals and microorganisms. All of that is ignored in an economic arena. So that I end up arguing with the CEO of a company and my hands are tied behind my back. The real reasons we're fighting that forest aren't in the economic equation. And so this is a fundamental problem that, that we face today. I, uh, I realize that we can't go on having battles because if we battle, we have a winner and we have a loser. And we're all a part of this spaceship Earth. We have to come together in some way and begin to work together. So four years ago, I received a phone call from the CEO of one of the largest companies, uh, oil sand companies in the Alberta tar sands. And he said, could I come and see you? I said, of course. I would be honored, please come and see me. The next morning he showed up in Vancouver, came to my foundation, and I said, you know, I'm thrilled that you're here, thank you very much, you honor me. I went through all that stuff, right? And then I said, if you would do me one favor, before you come through that door, please leave your identity as a CEO of an oil company outside. I want to meet you man to man, human being to human being, because I want to talk to you, Mr. CEO. What do we agree on? Why should we be negotiating or arguing if we don't start with a common basis of agreement? What kind of a world do we want? He was very, very... Uh, reluctant to come in that door. That's not what, he had come down as a CEO of an oil company. He wanted to talk to me that way. But to his credit, he came in the door. So I said, uh, thank you. I know that this is difficult. So let me tell you where I'd like to begin the conversation. I said, we live in a world which is, uh, which is shaped and constrained by laws of nature. That is, there's nothing we can do about it that's the way our world is. I said, in physics, we know we can't build a rocket that will travel faster than the speed of light. 
No one says, we need to go 20 times faster than the speed of light. That's the limit. We understand that. And we live in that world. The, the law of gravity says we can't build an anti-gravity machine here on Earth. The first and second laws of thermodynamics mean you can't build a perpetual motion machine. Those are dictated to us by nature. We live within the constraints of those laws. And nobody objects to that. That's the way it is. Chemistry, it's the same. The atomic properties of the elements, the uh, diffusion constants and reaction rates all inform us as to the kind of chemical reactions we can carry out and the types of molecules we can synthesize. And we, we all agree. That, look, there's, you can't transcend those principles of chemistry. We live within that. And in biology, it's the same. Biology tells us every species has a maximum number that can be sustained indefinitely. That's dictated by the carrying capacity of the ecosystem or the habitat that species lives in. Plants, animals are all subject to the carrying capacity of where they live. Well, we could say, well, humans are different, we're smart, we don't have to, we're not confined to a single habitat or ecosystem. We use our brains and adapt our ecosystems and adapt to ecosystems. But the biosphere, the zone of air, water, and land where all life exists, is where we live. And the biosphere will dictate the carrying capacity for human beings, which will be predicated on the number of humans and our consumption per capita. And that will dictate what can be, what population of humans can be maintained indefinitely. Every scientist I've talked to who's thought about this agrees we're way past the carrying capacity of the planet for human beings. But uh, that's a whole other story. So this is what I told the, the CEO. I said, look, there are limits to how many humans uh, can exist on the planet, but also biology informs us that we're an animal. We're an animal species. I gave a talk in Austin, Texas years ago. There were a lot of children in the audience, and I said, now if there's one thing you remember from my talk, remember we are animals. Man, did their parents get pissed off at me. <laughs> Don't call my daughter an animal. We're human beings. And my response was, if you're not an animal, are you a plant? Because biology tells us we're animals. We're biological organisms. And as animals, I said to the CEO, as an animal, what is the most important thing you and I and every human being on the planet needs? <clears throat> now, any child will tell you right away. He paused. I could see his brain is going, a job, money, yeah. I said, look, if you don't have air for three minutes, you're dead. If you have to breathe contaminated air, you're sick. So can you not, as a human being, agree with me, clean air has got to be the highest need of all human beings on the planet. And then I said, you and I, we're 60 to 70% water by weight. We're just a big blob of water with enough organic thickener added, we don't dribble away on the floor. <laughs> but our, our bodies leak water, right? It comes out of our skin and our mouth and our eyes and our crotch and we lose water all. So we have to keep drinking it. If you don't have water, Mr. CEO, for Four to six days, you're dead. If you have to drink polluted water, you're sick. So can you not agree with me that clean water, like clean air, is a primary need of all human beings? And then I said, well, food is different. We can go for quite a long time without food, but uh, if you go for four to six weeks without food, you'll die. And uh, if you have to drink contaminated, or eat contaminated food, you'll, you'll sicken. And most of our food comes from the earth, comes from the soil. So again, could we not agree that clean earth, clean soil and food is up with clean air and clean water? And then I said, every bit of the energy in your body and mine, all of that energy that we need to move and grow and reproduce produce is sunlight. Sunlight captured by plants in photosynthesis, converted into chemical energy, and then we eat the plants or the animals that eat the plants, and we acquire those molecules of energy and store them in our body so that when we want to move or work, we burn those molecules and liberate the sun back out in our bodies. So photosynthesis coming from all of the green things on Earth, should be a high priority. And finally, I said, Mr. CEO, the miracle of life on the planet, these four things, 
that indigenous people call the four sacred elements, earth, air, fire, and water. These four things, which are so critical for all of us, are delivered to us. They're replenished, they're created, they're restored by the web of living things on earth. Water is filtered through as it percolates through the soil by my, soil microorganisms. While air is created by all of the green things that contribute the oxygen. Without photosynthesis, there would be no oxygen in the atmosphere. It's, uh, uh, life creates the soil. And life is our food. Every bit of our food was once alive. And so I suggested that this, can you not agree with me? This is a foundation for any, any group of human beings, that protecting clean air, clean water, clean soil and food and clean energy and diversity of other creatures is the heart of what gives us uh, survival and uh, a, a good way of living. I said to him, Mr. CEO, if you will shake hands with me and agree, those things are the foundation of the way we must live then I will do everything I can to help you and your company. I'm sorry to say that he couldn't shake hands with me. And this is the problem that we face. The reality is it was unfair of me to have that conversation. He had come down as the CEO of an oil company. If he were to go back to his shareholders and say, look, I had a conversation with Suzuki, I have to agree, whatever we do, we can't do anything that will muck up the air, water, and soil. He'd get fired in a flash. That's not his job. And so I believe this is the challenge that we face. We have created an economic system that, is, that doesn't make any sense in, in the real world. You see, we have laws of nature that we live with, but then there are other things, the boundaries that we draw around our property, our cities, our provinces, or our, <coughs> our countries. Those are not, they don't emerge from nature. Nature doesn't give a shit about borders that we draw. You know, with salmon is born in British Columbia waters, goes out into the, through a, the Alaskan panhandle up along the coast of Russia and Japan. Whose salmon are they? They don't belong to anyone. Salmon know that, but we don't. We fight over them all the time when they come into our territory. But those lines don't mean anything to nature. And then we create things like capitalism, the economy, markets, corporations. Those are not forces of nature. Yet you talk to people today, you talk to politicians, talk to business people, and my God, you would believe the market is a real thing. Look at the papers, look at the business page. Oh, market's not looking too healthy today. You think the market is a thing with a cold compact on its head going, oh God, do I feel crummy today. You know, like what? The market is something we invented. It's not a force of nature. We can't, we constantly ask nature to fit our demands, our borders, our economies, our corporation, corporate demands, uh, we, the, the market forces, we, all, we look to them as if somehow nature has got to conform to them. Those are the only things we can change. They're human constructs. We can change the economy. We can change the concept of a market. We can change boundaries. And we have to learn a way of living in a different way then with the rest of nature. And that's why to me, uh, the most, at my age and at my stage in life, uh, you know, you don't look too far ahead, but uh, there is something that has been very exciting to me as an opportunity to begin to change our perspective on the way that we see the world around. And this is what we've called the Blue Dot Movement. The Blue Dot, of course, is planet Earth. And uh, we began uh, two years ago when we took a bus from Newfoundland and traveled across Canada for seven weeks we stopped in 22 different communities, and it was to get communities to sign on uh, 
to uh, pass local legislation for a healthy environment, to protect a healthy environment. Because our long-term goal then is to get grassroots support for this concept of a constitutional change. If we can get broad grassroots support, then we go to the provinces and we have to get seven provinces with more than 50% of the population of Canada to agree. And once we've got that, we go to the federal government and ask for a constitutional uh, amendment to enshrine the right to a healthy environment. Now, what is a healthy environment? Uh, a healthy environment, of course, is clean air, clean water, clean soil, and, and food, biodiversity, clean energy. So I, we, uh, I thought when we started the campaign that I wouldn't probably live to see it be successful. I've been astounded at the sign-on. Uh, when we started the, the tour, I said, if we can get a community to sign on to the idea within six months, after the tour is over, that will be the beginning of the movement. Well, three weeks after we started, the first community signed on. That was Richmond, British Columbia. By the time the tour was over, we had six communities, including one that was very interesting, the PA in Manitoba. And uh, we had a website about the Blue Dot uh, movement, and a grade six teacher saw our film, it was a one or two minute film, and she was so excited, she took it to her grade six class, showed it to them, and the students said, let's go to the mayor and get do the PA to uh, pass uh, environmental, a healthy environment. And uh, they took, oh no, they invited a city councilor to come, the mayor, to come and view the, vi the video, he did. And then he said, you kids should come to the city council and show it to the council members. They did, and they unanimously passed uh, a, a law about a healthy environment. So that was one of the six communities by the time we finished the tour. We now have more than 140 communities that have signed legislation for a healthy environment, including Vancouver, Toronto, and uh, Montreal. Where the hell is Saskatoon? Where is Regina? Do you not believe in the need for, to protect a healthy environment? Uh, we have people here in the back that have forms for the, the shaking their hands up there who uh, have petitions if you want to sign and be part of the Blue Dot movement. One out of every three Canadians now lives in a jurisdiction that is signed on to the Blue Dot uh, hope. So we're, we're, this is a movement, a massive movement. I feel we're now working with uh, three provinces on getting provincial buy-in, including Ontario and Quebec. And uh, I think that we're, we're on a, a huge role, and I hope Saskatoon and Regina will join us uh, very soon. But that's the beginning, I hope, of a different way of looking at our place in this world. Thank you very much.